grateful for the opportunity to study your word together, the prophecies. And as we look at that information that you've given in the Bible, Lord, we ask that you would continue to bless us to our purpose, and that's to see Jesus and how much he loves us, the plan he has for our lives, and that we would grow spiritually in our understanding of what you have revealed. And so we ask for the promise that you have given to be fulfilled, that you would come and be our teacher as you study our word tonight. And so we thank you for this opportunity, and we ask that you would bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, I invite you to welcome our speaker up, Eric Frecking, tonight as we continue in the series. Well, thank you very much. Good to see you guys back here tonight. Thanks for coming out, taking time. Um, I bet you all day long you've been thinking to yourself, oh, I just can't wait to get there and get a quiz going. So we're going to give you a quiz on last night's topic for those of you who are here. Now, here's the drill. I'm going to say the question, and don't say it out loud, write it down. And then we're going to go through it a second time, a little bit later, and then you can give me your answer. Okay, by the way, here's my wife right here. So wave to everybody, Beatrice. You saw a couple of pictures of her last night, but don't tell, uh, tell her which ones I had up there of her. She'll get mad at me. Okay, so let's do a little quiz. So just write these down. Don't say them. Question number one, what signs in the religious world did Jesus say would take place just before he came? What signs in the religious world did he say would take place? I'll give you a clue. Don't say it, but it's false blank and blank. False blank and blank. What signs did he say in the religious world? Write that down. I'm going to go through rather quickly, so you write quickly, as quick as you can. Number two, what book of the Bible promises a blessing to those who read, hear, and follow its content? Now, of course, you're, you're blessed by reading any portion of Scripture, but there's one book of the Bible that promises that blessing to those who read, hear, and follow its content. Which book of the Bible is that? Number two. Question number three. True or false? When studying Bible prophecy, the Bible interprets itself. Is that one true or is that one false? When you're studying Bible prophecy, the Bible would interpret itself. True or false? Number four, 276 of the 404 verses in Revelation are partial or direct quotes from where? I'll give you a clue. It's not the newspaper, all right? So where is it from? 276 of the 404 verses in Revelation are partial or direct quotes from what source? Very important. And then number five, true or false, this one's going to be kind of a a difficult one now. The majority of the book of Revelation should be taken literally. Is that true or is that false? Now, a lot of people get this one wrong, so think before you put your answer. The majority of the book of Revelation should be taken literally. And this is a real problem that people have when they try to interpret the Bible because... uh, they misunderstand what the scripture is saying. I'm going to show you a verse here in just a moment. Okay, I'm going to give you a bonus question so that everybody can get 100%. If I, if I were a teacher, I'd be the easiest teacher in the world. I'd want to give everybody A. So here we go. Uh, which of the following is a sign that Jesus is coming soon? A, increase in earthquakes. B, knowledge would increase. C, people would be running to and fro. D, the gospel would go to all the world. E, moral decay at the end of time. Or F, all of the above. So which one of these is most true? Write that down on your little quiz envelope. Okay, you think you got them all right? Okay, let's try it. Okay, tell me what you put down here. What signs in the religious world did Jesus say would take place just before he came? What was it, everybody? Excellent. Very good. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders, and they would come in his name. The prophets would be speaking in his name, and a lot of people would be deceived by this. That's why we know, need to know the word of God for ourselves. And question number two, what book of the Bible promises a blessing to those who read here and follow its content? Which one, everybody? Okay, very good. Here's what it says. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear. And as I said last night, you've come out to hear about prophecy. The words of this prophecy and then keep those things which are written in it. So when God gives us uh, information and insights into his word, then he hopes and he expects you and I to follow it. And so that's what the Bible says. You're blessed if you do that. Question number three, true or false? When studying Bible prophecy, the Bible interprets itself. That's absolutely true. Very good. And and we're going to see that night by night. And I told you that what happens with a lot of people who study the Bible is they go to current events and then they try to jam those current events into Bible prophecy. And they're always having to change their interpretation where the Bible does not need that help. And so we're going to let the Bible interpret itself out here. Question number four, 276 of the 404 verses in Revelation are partial or direct quotes from where, everybody? Excellent. Very good. Now let me give you a couple of examples of this. In Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, I'm going to give you the extended schedule on Tuesday. We're going to have an extended schedule, and we have eight extra nights, uh, so there's like 16 nights total. But on one of those nights, we're going to look at these two women in Revelation. And so let me just share this verse with you. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. 
Now, notice it calls her Babylon. Now, it's not talking about literal Babylon, ancient Babylon that existed a long time ago. This is talking about the spirit of Babylon. And so in the Old Testament, when we understand what Babylon did to God's people and tried to do to God's people, then it's much easier to understand what spiritual Babylon is going to do to people at the end of time. So it's very, very important to understand these stories and these, uh, these, uh, to understand the book of Revelation. Now, let me give you one other uh, verse here on this subject. In Matthew 24, I want you to notice what book of the Bible Jesus wanted you and I to understand. He says this a couple of places in the Gospels. Therefore, when you see the abomination of de desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. What does he want you and I to understand? He wants us to understand the book of Daniel. And so actually, for the first few nights, we're going to be mostly in the book of Daniel. And then it's going to be much easier to understand the book of Revelation. And you'll see uh, very clear how well this method works. All right, question number five. Now, this is a toughie. The majority of the book of Revelation should be taken literally. Is that true or is that false? True. Okay, see, I heard a little mixture here. It's actually false, but good guess. I appreciate your courage, those who have guessed wrong. Now, is this just my opinion? Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to make you a promise out here. When I tell you something's my opinion, I'm going to say that ahead of time, all right? Because I do have some opinions on things, and I'll be honest with you. But I want you to notice this is not my opinion. This is what the Word of God says. Now, in the very first verse of the book of Revelation, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which will shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Now, the Greek word there for signified, so he sent and signified it. The Greek word there is semino. And what that means is to make known by signs or symbols. So right there in the very first verse, it says this is a book about signs or symbols. So we need to be very careful when we try to take these things literally. And you'll see uh, that later on in the seminar. Okay, last one. Which of the following is a sign that Jesus is coming soon? Which one is, is most correct, everybody? Okay, very good. F. How many got 100% with the bonus question? Anybody? Okay, how many just got one wrong? How many don't like the raising of the hand in public? Can I see your hands? All right, just kidding. All right, let's do some questions now. Now, I did not get any questions that came in. If you wrote a question down, it didn't get to me, so I'm not avoiding anybody's question. Uh, if you did write a question down, write it in again, and we'll answer it. And so I stacked the deck tonight uh, to help us understand tonight's lecture. And the first question I want to answer is, what was Daniel, a follower of God, doing in the pagan kingdom of Babylon? So if you've read the Old Testament, for a good chunk of the Old Testament, God's people were the Jews, or Israel. And uh, by the time of Daniel, 10 of those tribes were taken into captivity by the Assyrians and left just two, three tribes left, right? And so what was Daniel, a follower of God, doing in the pagan kingdom of Babylon? Well, you remember, God loved his people, and he tried over and over and over again to reach them. And they constantly were in rebellion, and God in his great love would raise up a prophet, and he would send that prophet to them. Finally, God sent the prophet Jeremiah, and Jeremiah told them that if they do not repent and turn from their ways, that he was going to have Babylon come and destroy Jerusalem. And they did not turn, and that's exactly what happened. Babylon came actually three different times and eventually destroyed the city. The Bible says this, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar. Anybody ever heard of the name Nebuchadnezzar before? Okay, we're going to read a lot about him tonight. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. On one of these occasions, he took back some captives. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But on one of the other occasions, the last one I believe it was, he annihilated the city and destroyed that beautiful temple, Solomon's temple. Okay, so on this occasion here in Daniel chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Then the king instructed Ashpenaz to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants, young men in whom there was no blemish but good-looking, so Daniel was a good-looking young man, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. So here's what Nebuchadnezzar did. See, if you're going to try to dominate and control the world, Nebuchadnezzar had a pretty good strategy. And what that was was when he'd go into these providences, and when he'd conquer an area, he'd take back the cream of the crop, he'd take them back to Babylon, try to basically brainwash them in the Babylonian ways, and then send them back as ambassadors to the Babylonian Empire. And so that's what Daniel was there for. They were trying to convert Daniel. But instead of them making an impact on Daniel, Daniel had a tremendous impact on him. And that's why the book of Daniel is so uh, powerful. Now, here's an artist's depiction of the ancient city of Babylon. And, of course, Nebuchadnezzar, when he would return from his victories, he would enter in through this gate. Does anybody know what that gate, that famous gate is called in Babylon? 
the Ishtar Gate, right? And this was called the Procession Way. All the people in Babylon would line up and they would cheer Nebuchadnezzar as he came back with all this booty. Now, I had the privilege years ago of seeing the Ishtar Gate. I was actually with Pastor Clark on this, and here it is. And our tour guide told us something I thought was really interesting. Now, he, he was speculating here, but he said that he believed that when Daniel walked through the Ishtar Gate for the first time, and he looked at all these little caricatures. All these little caricatures here represent Babylonian gods. And when Daniel walked in, he looked at those Babylonian gods and he realized what he was going to be exposed to in this city. He said a prayer, our tour guide said, he said a prayer like, Lord, help me be faithful to you no matter what. And so when I walked through the Ishtar Gate for the first time, I said that prayer. I said, Lord, help me be faithful to you no matter what the world throws at me. There's nothing in this world that is worth sacrificing your relationship with Christ. Can you say amen to that, everybody? All right, so that's, what Dan, that's why Daniel was in Babylon. Now, let me do a little connection here and connect the past with the present. Now, ancient Babylon is where Iraq is today. Now, have we heard a lot about Iraq in the last 30 years in our society, yes or no? Yeah, you remember this fellow right here, Saddam Hussein? Now, Saddam believed that he was a great, great, great grand descendant of Nebuchadnezzar, this king that we're going to look at tonight. Now, notice what Time Magazine says here. Saddam had himself photographed not long ago in a replica of the war chariot of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king whom Saddam apparently reveres as a hero. An American soldier took this picture right here, this billboard. You see Saddam right there, and behind him is Nebuchadnezzar. Here's a coin from Iraq. There is Saddam and Nebuchadnezzar. And that's why when Saddam began to invade these countries, the, everybody took notice. Why? Because they knew that he was trying to do what Nebuchadnezzar had done, and that was control and dominate that area, right? Okay, so let's go on. Now, tonight's prophecy is in Daniel chapter 2. What is the significance of this prophecy? Now, tonight's prophecy that we're going to look at is so powerful, yet it's so simple and so important. Why is this prophecy important? Well, number one, it proves that the Bible is the inspired word of God. Now, I want you to notice what the Bible says here, God speaking in Isaiah 46. He says, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Now, let's pause right there. So if God says, I am God and there is no other, I am God, there is none like me, you can sit back and you say, okay, God, how are you going to prove that? It's like the kid on the playground that says, you know, I'm the fastest kid on the play playground. How's he going to prove that? He's got to beat everybody in the race. God says, I am God and there's nobody like me. How are you going to prove that, God? Here's what he, how he proves that. Because I declare the end from the beginning. Now, if you can do that, that is impressive. See, nobody in here knows what's going to happen really in an hour. We might guess, right? But God says, I can declare the end from the beginning. And tonight's prophecy, we're going to see, starts in the days of Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, 600 years before Christ, and takes us all the way down to the second coming of Christ, where God predicts the rise and fall of 14 world empires. It's a phenomenal prophecy. By the way, there's so many skeptics, of course, of the Bible, and they look at this prophecy, and they, here's my, uh, I'll tell you a story real quick, but they look at this prophecy, and they, um, they say, well, the Bible must have written, been written much later by somebody who claimed to be Daniel. It really wasn't written by this fellow by the name of Daniel in the, in the uh, country of Babylon. But uh, when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, I can't go into to all of it, but the Dead Sea Scrolls were strong evidence that the book of Daniel was written much earlier than what these skeptics said. And if you really look in the evidence, there is just so much rock-solid evidence for you and I to believe that the book of Daniel and these prophecies were written well in advance before they actually happened. By the way, there's, if you, anybody ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, by the way? Um, my daughter was on a little house in the prairie kick right there, and that's why she was wearing that little bonnet. <laughs> Anyways, so if you ever get a chance to see the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're phenomenal, phenomenal find. Okay, so why is this prophecy important? It proves the Bible to be the inspired word of God. Number two, it gives us the ABCs of Bible prophecy. Now, I had the privilege of teaching my daughter how to read, and, uh, you know, when, you, when you're teaching a kid how to read, you think they're never going to get it, but it's so amazing how fast they pick it up. Now, the first thing I taught my daughter when, we, when I was teaching how to read, I taught her a song. You know how that song goes? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Now, how many of you care to admit that when you're trying to figure out a letter that either comes before or after a letter in the alphabet, you sing that song really fast in your head? Anybody else do that besides me? All across the country, everybody does that, right? So once you learn that song, you've laid a foundation. And once you have a foundation, you can build on that. And tonight's prophecy is very simple, and, but it lays a foundation so that when we come to the Antichrist and other prophecies, we already have this solid foundation to build on. So keep that in mind as we go through tonight's prophecy. And then number three, Tonight's prophecy tells us who is going to be the next world ruler. And you've got to wait to the very end to get that. Okay, number, the last question for tonight, very important question. Why did God create us? 
Now, you know, the, really the three most important questions in life for you and for me are these three right here. Why am I here? Where did I come from? And where am I going? And if you have an answer to these, a good answer to these questions in your life, you have a lot of purpose, a lot of sense of purpose, a lot of security. But a lot of people are just wandering through life. They don't know why they're here. They don't know where they've come from. And they have no idea where they're going. And the Bible provides a beautiful answer for all three of these. But the question I want to look at tonight is, why did God create us? Well, first of all, we are not the only beings that God has created. The Bible says this in Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, you his, what everybody? His angels. The Bible talks about seraphim and cherubim. So we are not the only species that God has created who excel in strength, who do his word, exceeding the voice of his word. You know, in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said the angels specifically watch over the little ones. And those of us that have children, we know how important that is. One day, uh, my daughter, when she was little, she was in a different room than me, and I uh, just felt impressed to go check on her. And I, as I walked in the room, she had this little piece of metal, and she was just about ready to stick it into a light socket. And I caught her said, no, don't do that. And I always felt that an angel prompted me to go and, and to, uh, to look at her, right? But we are not the only beings that God has created. Now, why did God create us? Well, notice what Jeremiah 31 verse 3 says. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. The Bible says that God is love. And so he created for the purpose of love. He wanted someone to love him, and he wanted someone to love him back. You see what I'm saying, everybody? That's why he created us. Now, whenever you do that, whenever you try to, to uh, you know, procreate, like God has given the human race uh, the ability to do, whenever you do that, there is a, there is a challenge. There is a, what's the word I'm uh, looking, uh, looking for? A, a risk. That's it, risk. Okay, and here's the risk. Because in order for love to be genuine love, it must not only grant you the right to say yes, it must also give you the right to say what, everybody? In other words, when God created us, he gave you and I freedom of choice. He did not pre-program us to love him and serve him or not to love him and serve him. You and I can choose that on our, choose to love him because we trust him and we believe that he's got a beautiful character or we can choose not to. And that was a major risk that God took. Now, there's a lot of Christians who almost believe that God has pre-programmed certain people to be saved or lost. And if you want to write a question in about a specific verse, like God hardened Pharaoh's heart, I'll be happy to, to answer that. But it is, it is not match up with the totality of Scripture. God gave you and I freedom to choose. Now, here's a picture of my wife and I on our wedding day, a much younger picture of us. And uh, you see here, what's interesting about this picture is that there's nobody with a gun in my wife's back forcing her to marry me. She did it out of her own freedom of choice. Now, some people come to the place where they think, yeah, I wish I was, was kind of married to a robot. I'm having so many problems. Or I wish they just did everything I wanted them to do. But I tell you, my friends, after a few days, that would get old very quickly because you would know that you pre-programmed to do all these things. And I'll tell you a quick story. Um, you know, I travel a lot, and um, when I get home at night, my daughter, before she goes to bed, oftentimes she'll wait up for me, and she always comes into my bedroom, and she always gives me a kiss on my cheek before she goes to bed. And you know how that makes me feel? I, every time, I, my heart just pounds. Cause, and I, but you know what? But if I knew that I pre-programmed her to do that, that wouldn't give me that beautiful, loving sensation. And so when God created us, he gave us freedom of choice. Now, why am I emphasizing this? Because there was an angel in heaven by the name of Lucifer who decided not to love and to trust God, and he led out in a rebellion. And a lot of angels followed this, his lead. And the Bible says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and his angels fought. Eventually they were cast out of heaven and found refuge here on planet Earth. And even though we cannot see them, my friends, this world is crawling with demons who are trying to influence you in a negative way, away from God and away from his word. And they will use lies, they will use deception, and, uh, you know, our roadmap is the word of God. But every human being, every man, woman, and child needs to make a choice of what side of this great war they're going to be on. Are they going to be with Christ or are they going to be with Satan? And you and I need to make that choice. Okay, that's the questions for tonight. Let's do our little gift drawing, Pastor Clark. We've got two books here. One is The Incredible Power of Prayer. Phenomenal little read. You won't be able to put that down. The story's in it. And the second one is on Bible prophecy and the second coming of Christ called The Appearing. So whoever wins first gets to pick first. All right, so I'm just going to read the last three numbers because the first four are the same. The last three are 264. 264. Okay, good for you. Which book would you like? Right. 
I was holding a meeting like this, and, you know, we have these raffle tickets, and one lady got the number 666, and so we just uh, we gave her a book for free. We felt so bad for her. <laughs> All right, the last one is 252, 252, 252. Going once, 252. Okay, there, okay, very good. You got a good book there. All right, well, the topic tonight is, will there be a new world order? Now, some people believe that the United Nations is kind of working behind the, scene to, the scenes to, totally, to, to eventually try to control and dominate the world. And we're not going to get into any conspiracy theories out here. But some other people believe that maybe communism is going to try to raise its ugly head again. You know, countries like China are becoming so powerful, powerful economically and, and militarily. And also, some people believe that maybe Islam, you know, Islam is one of the fastest growing religions. It might even be the fastest growing religions in the world, last time I looked. And they, some people believe that maybe Islam is going to try to control and dominate the world. But who does the Bible say? What does the Bible teach on who is going to be the next world ruler? Well, in order to understand that question, we need to go back to Daniel chapter 2 to an ancient king's dream, one of the most phenomenal prophecies in all of Scripture. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, now you can go, when you get home tonight, you can read the whole chapter. We're just going to highlight a few verses here. But notice what it says. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled, and he could not sleep. Now, you and I have dreams all the time, right? And sometimes when we wake up, we think, oh, that was kind of weird. I wonder if God's trying to tell me something here. But this dream really troubled him. And when he woke up, he couldn't remember it, but he couldn't forget it either. He knew that the gods were trying to speak to him. So he had a little protocol. He had these fellows that he paid. And the Bible says, so the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. Now, by the way, let me just spend a little mo a moment on here, Babylon, Babylon's wise men. You have these magicians, these sorcerers, and these astrologers. Does God's word con uh, to support these people, or does it, uh, uh, what's, does it not support them? Okay, it does not. It calls it an abomination, actually. So Nebuchadnezzar called these people in. Now, by the way, is this just some ancient pagan thing of the past? Or do our leaders, some of our leaders, still go and seek out some of these people to, to this day? And you better believe it. Here's Time Magazine. Notice this right here. Astrology in the White House. Nancy Reagan and Ronald Reagan heavily involved in astrology to you know, organize and to schedule his plans. Now, I'm not, I'm not picking on a Republican here. I'm, I'm not... Uh, I'm not uh, going to bring politics into this, but it's really shocking and really sad that some of our leaders would go seek out these things when the Bible calls it an abomination, right? Now, so these wise men came in and stood before the king. Well, you guys were laughing at that picture. I was going to tell you, okay, you want to hear the story? All right, I'll tell you the story. Okay, I, uh, for sake of time, I thought I'd better cut some out. Okay, of course, you know who that is right here. And uh, you remember very early on in the Clinton years, uh, Bill Clinton's approval rating was very low. And he was wondering, well, what's going on here? And so he hired this fellow, and they did some studies, and uh, they found out that it wasn't really that they disliked him, but they disliked the position his wife had taken. Because you remember when Clinton ran for office, he said, you're getting two for the price of one. And at, the, at that time, Americans wanted her to take a more traditional first lady role. So what Hillary did, now this is not a conspiracy theory. This was a report of the Associated Press. She went and talked to one of these ladies who claims to talk to the dead, and she claims to have talked to Eleanor Roosevelt to find out how to be a good first lady. And it's very shocking and alarming that our leaders would do this when it's so despicable in the Bible, right? So there, you feel, feel better? I picked on a Republican and a Democrat. All right, let's go on then. So when these wise men came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I've had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. And if you read on, they say, oh, king, live forever. Please tell, you what to dream. Tell, me what, tell us what you dream. And Nebuchadnezzar says, I don't know it. I don't remember it. And things start to get heated there. And finally, they say, look, we cannot do it. And Nebuchadnezzar says in verse 5, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me in its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces, and your house shall be made an ash heap. So Nebuchadnezzar is beginning to realize that these guys, guys are phony, that they do not have the insights that he thought they, they did. And so he says, you're going to be killed. And so verse 13, so the decree went out and they began killing the wise men and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Now, let me just kind of give you an idea, a uh, picture in your mind's eye how it went. So this fellow by the name of Arioch, he knocks on the door and Daniel opens up the door and Arioch says to him, Daniel, I'm really sorry, but I'm here to kill you. And Daniel's like, whoa, please, what's happened? And so Arioch tells him what took place. Daniel says, please, let me talk to the king. Daniel goes in before the king, and he basically says this. I don't know the dream, 
And I don't know the interpretation, but I know the one who does. If you will give me a little time, I will get the dream and I'll get the interpretation before you. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not told how long he gave him. Maybe he gave him 24 hours. But Daniel went back. Now, his life was on the line. So what do you think Daniel did? Do you think he got the astrology column out and he sought out the psychics? What do you think he did, everybody? No, he prayed. He got on his knees. He got his buddies together. And he prayed like he had never prayed before. Now, I'm going to go on the story here in just a moment. But I want to give you a little testimony about prayer. Uh, you know, I believe in prayer. And I believe that we as Christians access this powerful resource far, far too little as much as, you know, as, as we should. And so let me share you this little testimony in prayer. When I was around 16 years of age, I made the brilliant decision of smoking my first cigarette. And when I, when I did that, you know, I thought it was so cool. And I thought everybody, you know, we, when you do stuff like that, you think everybody's looking at you. And you don't realize no one even cares. But I learned how to blow smoke rings, you know. Well, I was also an athlete. And athletics and chewing tobacco didn't go well together. And so about a year later, I decided to switch over to chewing tobacco. Now, this is the kind that I chewed. And by the way, one doctor told me that he saw a study that nicotine and chewing tobacco and smoking is equally as addictive as heroin is. It is an extremely, those of you who have battled with nicotine, you know how difficult this is to overcome. Well, I changed over to, to the Kodiak here, the Kodiak bear. And, uh, you know, I was an athlete and a baseball player, so they kind of seemed to go hand in hand. And I, you know, I was the type of kid who walked around with that big chew in your mouth, and I thought it was so cool. And I read that the Kodiak uh, version there, what they do is they put little pieces of fiberglass inside of the, 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 the tobacco there so that it punctures little holes into your skin so the blood can go right into your, you know, your, excuse me, the nicotine can go right into your blood. It is an extremely addictive thing. And after about a year of chewing, I was completely hooked on it. I mean, my t entire life revolved around chewing tobacco. When I woke up in the morning, it was the first thing I thought about. All throughout the day, I had to be sure that my tobacco was right near me. And the, first th or the last thing I did before I went to bed was had my chew, right? And uh, I began to notice some things in my mouth that were taking, uh, changing. I noticed that my gum line was deteriorating a little bit. I also noticed that when I put this tobacco in my mouth, it would be really, really inflamed and that really painful at times. And I even saw some, uh, some blood. And I also noticed that where my cheek meets my gum, there was little pockets developing. I thought to myself, well, this isn't good. And then to make matters worse for me, one night I was watching a little segment on, I don't remember if it was 60 Minutes or 2020 or something like that, and they had a little segment on leukoplakia. And the fellow that was on there, he got leukoplakia so bad that they actually had to remove his lower jaw. Now, here's a picture I took in New Mexico. They had this uh, a billboard there. And uh, that's what it looks like when you get your lower jaw removed. And I'm looking at this segment, and this kid who was a baseball player just like I was, he was about five, six years older than me, and he was describing the symptoms that led up to this leukoplakia, and some of them were very similar to what I was experiencing. And I thought to myself, oh, man, i got to quit chewing tobacco because, hey, I wanted to get married someday, and we all want to get married to the best-looking person possible, right? And... Uh, <clears throat> And, you know, it's not like it's losing a leg or something where you can hide it. It's smack dab right in the middle of your face. And so I decided that I needed to quit. And this is after about five years of chewing. And so I read all these little articles on how to quit and stuff, and I just couldn't. I could go about four hours without chewing, but, you know, either one of my buddies chewed or I'd, I'd cave in and go buy it. And for the next year and a half, I did everything that I could to try to quit, and I just couldn't. So here's what my day was like sometimes. I'd drive over to my friend's house. They lived like 12 miles from me. I'd be driving over there, and in a moment of gusto, I'd roll my window down and take that tin of chew and throw it out the window. And then returning home about three hours later from my buddy's house, I'd pull over on the side of the road and get down my hands and knees and try to find that tin of chew, right? And so those of you who have been addicted, you know this roller coaster. And finally, I came to the conclusion, I just cannot quit. I'm going to eventually get leukoplakia and lose my lower jaw. And you know, God is so good to us that when we give up on doing things ourselves, that's when God can step in and really do powerful things in our lives. And just right around that town, time when I gave up on myself, a friend of mine who I played baseball with, he was a very devout Christian, and he invited me to his church and he said, Eric, I'm going to be giving my personal testimony. I'd like you to come to my church. Now, I was not the church going type. I was this wild guy. You know, I have my BC days, I call them, Eric before Christ. And so I was this wild guy. And I thought that if I went into a church, I would just burst up into flames. You know, I was living such a wild life. But he was such a nice guy. He was so kind to me that I decided I'm going to go and listen to what he has to say. 
And I sat in the pew, and I listened to this guy talk about God in a way that I'd never heard anybody talk about God before, that God wanted to be very personally involved in all aspects of our life. He talked about how God had saved his marriage, how God had given him delivery over alcohol, victory over alcohol, and how God had given him victory over, guess what, everybody? Chewing tobacco. Now, I didn't know what was going on at the time, but the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, and it said, Eric, I can do that for you too. And so when I left that church that day, I was excited. I went out in my car, didn't even leave the church parking lot, and I looked that Kodiak bear right in the eye, and he was looking at me. And I said a little prayer like this. I said, Lord, I got a full tin of chew there, and tomorrow afternoon we have a baseball game. And I'm going to chew all day long today, and tomorrow I'm going to chew all day long, tomorrow all day long until the baseball game is over with, and then I pray that you will give me victory over this. Right? Something like that. So, hey, Brand new tin of chew, chewed all day long. The next morning, first thing I did before I even brushed my teeth, threw a chew in, chewed and spit all day long. Baseball game came, inning one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, chewed and spit the entire time. And when the ninth out, when the last out was made in the ninth inning, and as I was walking off the field, I spit that tobacco out of my mouth. And I have no idea what anybody else on that field was thinking, but I was praying like this, Lord, please take this from me. And I'm telling you, that was over 20 years ago without a word of a lie, like they say up in Canada, without a word of a lie, that from that moment over 20 years ago to this moment right now, I have never once since craved nicotine. That is the power of God, my friends. That's what God can do. When Jesus said, all power is given unto me, he wasn't just whistling Dixie. All power is available through Christ Jesus. And when we humble ourselves and get on our knees and cry out to God, he hears those prayers, my friend, and he will do powerful things in your life. Can you say amen to that, everybody? All right. So Daniel went back and prayed, and God gave him the exact same dream that night as he had given to Nebuchadnezzar. And so now the next day, Daniel goes in before the king, and notice what he says here. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. I love that right there. Daniel didn't take credit for it. Daniel could have made a lot of money off this right now. He'd become a, a millionaire in his day, right? but he didn't. He gave God all the glory and the credit. And he has made known to the king what will be in the what days, everybody? The latter days. So this prophecy begins in the days of Daniel and takes us all the way down to the second coming of Christ. Okay, here we go. Here's the dream. Now he's telling Nebuchadnezzar what the dream was. You, O king, were watching. Behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. This image's head was a fine what, everybody? Now, this is all very important because all these represent the great empires of antiquities. This image's head was a fine gold. Its chest and arms of what, everybody? Silver, okay. Its belly and thighs of bronze. Its legs of iron. Its feet part of iron and part of clay. You watch while a stone was cut out without hands. Now, this represents the coming of Christ. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Which struck the image on its feet of iron, clay, and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together. And the stone that struck them became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we tell the interpretation before the king. Now, can you imagine Nebuchadnezzar? He'd wanted to know this. He knew that it was something very significant. And I can picture it, something like this, as Daniel's explaining. And Nebuchadnezzar's like, yes, I remember the head of gold, then the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, the feet, part of iron, part of clay. Yes, I remember the, the stone cut out without hands was struck the image on the feet. I I remember it all. And then Daniel said, I'm going to give you a bonus, king. I'm going to tell you exactly what all of this means. So are you ready with your pens? You probably thought, we're never going to get to the study guide. Here we go. We're going to do the study guide now. Here's what he says. You, O king, are king of kings. You are this head of gold. Now, when Daniel says you, he's talking about Nebuchadnezzar and his empire of Babylon. You'll see that more in just a moment. But write this down. The head of gold represents Nebuchadnezzar's baby, his empire of Babylon, and Babylon ruled the then-known world from 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. Okay, I'll give you a minute to write that down. 605 B.C. to 539 B.C. While you're writing, I'll get a drink of water. All right, now Babylon was a very interesting city. It was huge, you know, especially for antiquities. It was a large city. If you look at how round the city was, you see it was 10 miles in circumference. And if you compare that with Rome, you can see it was almost twice as big. Now, my good friend here in the front row, Pastor David Tennell, he and I were over in Rome a couple of years ago. 
And while we were there, we were trying to save money because we were both on budgets. And we went out to see the cat- catacombs outside of the city. And we decided, instead of getting a taxi, to walk all the way across Rome to our hotel. And I'll tell you, that was quite a walk. But we felt good about it because we were eating a lot of gelatos. And so we were kind of burning that stuff off while we were doing it. But anyways, it was a huge city. And to think that Babylon was twice the size of Rome is really quite impressive. Now, Herodotus, he's the ancient Greek historian. And he tells us that the city of Babylon was filled with gold. Many of the statues and walls were made of gold. Some of the beds were even made out of gold. Babylon was the city of gold. So it's very fitting that God uses gold to depict the empire of Babylon. Now, notice this. This is an artist's depiction of the ancient city of Babylon. Babylon had a unique river that ran through the city. And that river is very important. Does anybody know what the name of that river is? Okay, the river Euphrates, right? And if you come to the sixth plague, you see the river Euphrates dried up. It's an allusion back to this story right here. But, you know, they had that river running right through the city, and so they had fresh water. And not only that, but we're told by the the ancient historians that Babylon had a 20-year food supply in it. So Babylon wasn't worried about anything. If somebody came and marched up on them, they had a 20-year food supply. Who's going to wait out 20 years? And they got the water that comes right through the city, and so it was party time all the time in the city of Babylon. Now, let me connect the past with the present because we look at these empires of antiquities and we think, oh, we're so far removed. But a lot of our mathematics actually come from Babylon. As a matter of fact, the way that we keep time comes from the Babylonians. Now, here's some archaeological pictures that I took in different museums that I've been to. This is a stone with Nebuchadnezzar's name on it. And Nebuchadnezzar was such an egomaniac that almost every stone in Babylon, he had his name stamped on it. Here's a letter from Nebuchadnezzar. He's talking about his empire here. He says, the whole earth prostrate at her feet. He wanted everybody to bow down at this great empire that he had developed, and he wanted it to go forever and ever and ever. Here's a picture of my little archaeology buddy here, and here's a letter from Nebuchadnezzar. And on one of these stones, he's talking about Babylon. He says, may it last how long, everybody? Forever. And so he must have been sorely disappointed when what Daniel said next would take place. Verse 39, but after you, Nebuchadnezzar, shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. And this really cut Nebuchadnezzar at the heart. Now, those of you who remember history, who conquered the then known world after the Babylonians? Who was that? Okay, no, close. It was Persia. The Medes and the Persians joined together. But it's really known in history as Persia because the Medes were kind of like second-class citizens, and Persia really dominated the day. And so the chests and arms of silver represent the mighty empire that dominated the then known world of Persia from 539 to 331 B.C. Okay? And the reason why it has two arms is because it was the Medes and the Persians that joined together to do that. So Persia, 539 to 331 B.C. Now remember, this, this is all predicted in advance. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, how did that great empire, how did that great city of Babylon fall? Well, there was a general by the name of Cyrus. And Cyrus marched on the city of Babylon and he surrounded it and he besieged it. And he wasn't the type of guy who wanted to wait out for 20 years. And so Cyrus got an idea. And by the way, this idea is all found in Scripture. And what he did was he, he knew the Babylonians were going to be having a big drunken feast on one of their celebrations. And so he told his men to go upstream where the river Euphrates was and dig channels. And they dug all these channels. And so downstream where Babylon was, the river went lower and lower and lower, and somehow he worked it out that the, the, the gate was unlocked, and he marched some of his men into the city, and they unlocked the gates, and the Persians came in, and they conquered the city of Babylon in one night, just like the Bible said. And you know what's so ph- phenomenal about these prophecies? See, when, the, when, when Daniel gave this prophecy, the devil did everything he could to build up this empire. And in one single night, This empire fell just like the Bible said it would. God's word can be trusted. All right, let's put a little context to the story. If you've read the book of Esther, you will see that that takes place in the days of Persia. She was married to a Persian king. The story of Daniel in the lion's den takes place in the days of Persian rule. Here's a picture of my wife and I, and da- or my daughter and, and my wife, at a Persian gallery up there in Chicago. Now, here's a picture of my buddy Dave here sitting here in the front row. I warned him. I said, Dave, I got a couple pictures here you t- of you tonight, so don't feel embarrassed, so he's okay with it. But anyways, this was, these were taken <clears throat> in the British Museum, and these are Persian plates. And what's very interesting is that they're made out of silver. And if you do some research on this, you will see 
see that the Persians used a lot of silver. They used it for their utensils, their plates, and a lot of their currency was silver. So not only did God foresee that these empires would come, he saw the chief metal that they would use. All right? So write that in. The chest and arms of silver represents Persia, or the Medes and the Persians. Medo-Persia, 538 to 331 B.C. Okay, let's go on with the prophecy. Daniel chapter 2, verse 39 says this. Then a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. So you tell me, who conquered the then known world after the Persians did? Okay, very good. The Greeks did. And of course, that's what the belly and thighs of bronze represent. 331 to 168 BC, that's when Greece dominated and controlled the then known world. So 331 to 168 B.C. is Greece. Now, does anybody remember who that famous general was that extended the army way far to the east? What was his name, everybody? Alexander the Great, of course. Now, here's a picture of Dave again. Sorry, Dave, this is, I think this might be the last one of you, so you don't have to be embarrassed anymore. But, okay, he always wants to tell this side of the story because he and I have done meetings like this together. He always wants to tell that he was really tired and that he was jet-lagged and that he thinks he looks bad in these pictures. I don't think he does. He looks nice. Anyways, so this is Alexander the Great here, an Alexand- uh, a statue of him, and it's made out of bronze. Here's another one of me in a museum down in Atlanta, and you see this little head here. I'll show you a closer up view. It's Alexander, and it's made out of bronze. Here's my wife and daughter in a museum in Minnesota. This is a Greek soldier's helmet, and it's made out of bronze. As a matter of fact, notice this little quote here. The Greeks were experts at smelting bronze. The soldiers wore breastplates of bronze, helmets of bronze, carried shields of bronze, and used swords made from bronze. And so once again, not only did God see the empire, he saw the metal that they would use to conquer the then known world. Phenomenal how God saw all this. Now let's connect the past with the present here. Of course, we get the Olympics from the Greeks. We get the New Testament from the Greek language. Now, I, Dave and I were actually at seminary together, and we had to learn Hebrew and Greek. And it was very difficult for me because I'm not great at languages. And uh, Greek was a lot easier than Hebrew because Hebrew, you, it, none of the, the letters look the same as ours, and you read it backwards. It was very difficult. But Greek is really similar to the English language. And so it was a lot easier for me to learn and understand. And so the New Testament was written in Greek. So in other words, a lot of the things in our culture, you'd be surprised, we can tra- simply trace back to the Grecian Empire, right? So write this in. The belly and thighs of bronze represent Greece. God saw all of this in advance, 331 to 168 B.C. Now Daniel says, finally, there will be a fourth kingdom. Strong is what, everybody? For iron breaks and smashes everything. Now who conquered the then known world after Greece, everybody? Okay, very good. And what are they called? They're called the Iron Monarchy of Rome. Why? Because they used a lot of iron. It was the Iron Age. And they used iron weaponry to conquer the then known world. Rome, 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. The legs of iron. Now, by the way, this is nothing new that I have just come up with. This has been a long-standing position in the Christian church. Even the Jews before Christ understood the prophecy, many of these uh, prophecies this way, because they hadn't seen it all, but they understood Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, notice this right here. Here's Jerome. He's a very famous early Christian, and he says this, moreover, the fourth kingdom, which plainly pertains to the Romans, is the iron which breaks in pieces and subdues all things. He was living in the days of the Roman Empire, and he understood this prophecy. Now, here's a picture that uh, Dave took of me with a This is, remember, uh, Tiberius Caesar? This is his sword, and it's made out of iron. Of course, as I said, they used iron weaponry to conquer the then known world. Let's do a little context here now. Of course, if you've read the New Testament, you know that Christ was born in the days of Roman occupancy. They occupied the area where Christ lived, down there in the area of Jerusalem and Judea. And so it, it was a Roman Caesar who made the decree who forced Mary to go back to Bethlehem, right? It was a Roman governor that put Jesus to death. It was, a Roman, it was the Romans who went to Jerusalem in 70 AD and destroyed the city. And they took back several Jews back to Rome and they made them build this thing right here called the Colosseum. By the way, this is a, called the Arch of Titus. This is a commemoration there of the destruction that the Romans did of Jerusalem in 70 AD. They brought them back to Rome and these Jews, that's why you read there when Christ wept 
for the people of Jerusalem. He foresaw what was going to take place to them. They took them back to Jerusalem. They worked them. Our tour guide told us that they would simply work these people to death. And when they died, they'd drag their body off and put somebody else in and work them to death. That's the Jews were responsible largely that were taken captive for building the Colosseum. And not only that, but of course the Christians were thrown into the Colosseums. Many of them were died in there. And it was Rome that did all of that. Okay, so let's connect the past with the present. A lot of uh, things that we have in our society we get from the Romans. Take our calendar, for example. This largely comes from the Romans. Also, the days of our, uh, our names, or the names of the days of the week that we have come from the Roman Empire. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That comes from Rome. And so, you know, these countries are not so, or these empires are not so far removed. We're still very connected to them even to this day. So write this down, Rome, the legs of iron, 168 B.C. to 476 A.D., all right? 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. Now, here's where the prophecy gets very interesting. Notice what it says. Now we're down into the feet and toes. And notice what the Bible says here. <clears throat> Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a what kind of kingdom, everybody? Okay, now notice what it's saying here. So God predicted there would be Babylon, then another kingdom would come, then another kingdom would come, then finally there would be a fourth one, and then this fourth one would not be conquered, be, would be divided. And it talks about the ten toes. So what happened? Rome would not be conquered, it would be divided. And that's exactly what happened to the Roman Empire. It was divided into roughly ten Germanic tribes. Okay, now, so write this in. What the toes and feet represent are divided Europe essentially as we know it today. 476 A.D. all the way down to 2019. Divided Europe, or you could put down Western Europe. Okay, divided Europe or Western Europe, 476 A.D. all the way down to our day. This prophecy stretches all the way out to, to us in 2019. Okay, now notice this right here. Here is the Germanic tribes that Rome was split up into in 476 A.D. when it fell apart. The Alamanni, that is now Germany. Now, by the way, how many are like me. I'm probably about 75% German. Anybody else largely German in here? Okay, several of you are. We did one of those DNA tests on my daughter. It was very interesting because my wife, and of course, she's a, uh, she grew up here in the United States, but her family's from Mexico. And it was very interesting, and it was very spot on to see my daughter. She's really kind of a mixture of all these things. But I'm largely German. The Franks, that's what Rome was divided into. That became France, Burgundy, Switzerland, Suave, Portugal, Lombards, Italy, Visigoth, Spain, Anglo-Saxons are England, the Vandals and the Herali and Ostrogoth, they're all destroyed. We'll talk about that when we come to the Antichrist. But it was basically Rome was divided into Western Europe like we see it today, right? So there you have it. The prediction that God made long time ago came to pass exactly how God said it would. Western Europe, 476 A.D., all the way down to the second coming of Christ. Okay, now let me just share. Uh, we're almost done here, but I want to share with a couple other thoughts. Now, this is very interesting here. Notice what verse 43. Now, it's talking about Western Europe, the ten toes, and it says this. They, Western Europe, will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they will not adhere one to another. Now you tell me, what does adhere mean? Does it mean stick together? It means stick, right? So when it says they will not adhere, it means they will not stick together. Now I'm not an expert on uh, European history, but I know enough to tell you this, that if I were to ever write out a little summary of what European history has been about, it's this. Men and women have come along and they have tried to unite Europe, either through marriage or war. But that is largely the history of Europe, that people have come along and they've tried to unite it. And the Bible says they're going to try to do that, but they will not do it. They will not stick together. Now, let me just share with you. That here's the Fredericksburg Castle, and it's a very famous painting over there. You had this famous queen, and she was known as the grandmother or the mother of all Europe. And they would try to marry their, little da their daughters and their sons to this prince and this duke and this princess, trying to unite Europe. But it just never worked out. They never were able to stick together. Now, just think about how many people have tried to unite Europe through war. Think about Napoleon, for example. Napoleon was one of the most famous ones that tried to do it. And notice what he said in his journal. There will be one Europe. There will be one currency. There will be one language. There will be one government over Europe. Now, see, what happened was the devil saw this prophecy. And the devil saw that God predicted that Europe would never be united. And so Satan inspired people like him, Napoleon, to come along and try to uh, override God's prediction. Now, notice what I was reading this book here called The Modern Church by Dr. Glenn T. Miller. And notice what it says here. In his dreams, 
Napoleon saw himself as the head of a united Europe that would recapture the grandeur of the ancient Roman Empire. What is it saying there? Napoleon wanted to be a Caesar. That's why that famous painting of Napoleon that he had done with him with a Caesar wreath around his head. That's what he wanted. That's what his aim was. That's what Satan inspired him to do, to go against this prophecy. But the Bible says, my friends, they will not adhere one to another. And at the Battle of Waterloo, One of Napoleon's generals said that he threw down his glasses and he said, God Almighty is too much for me. He realized he was not fighting against men. He was fighting against God and his word. And whenever you do that, you're always going to lose. Can you say amen to that, everybody? That's what happened to Napoleon. Charles V, the Holy Roman Empire, they, they tried and they failed. The Charlemagne tried and failed. Kaiser Wilhelm, Kaiser means Caesar, World War I, he tried and failed. Of course, probably the most famous is this fellow right here, Adolf Hitler. What was he trying to do? He was trying to, you know, Satan was inspired him to try to override this prophecy. That's exactly what was taking place. Now, here's a picture I took. This is Roman architecture right here. And you see that. What does that look like right there, everybody? So I saw that, and I thought it was very interesting. I took a picture of it, and then I did a little research. And I found that this was a very important symbol in the ancient Roman Empire. And so when the Nazis came along and they picked their symbol, they, of course, picked this swastika. They were trying to recapture the Roman Empire across Europe. Hitler said there will be one people, one empire, one leader. I've stood at the Reichstag. As a matter of fact, I think probably Pastor Aaron or somebody uh, with us, we were together there, took this picture. But here's where Hitler promised a thousand years this thing is going to last, right? And God didn't need a whole lot to stop Hitler. He just needed a little fog, and he was never able to unite Europe. Because the Bible says they will mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they will not adhere one to another. So here's the question. Who will be the next world ruler then? Well, notice what Daniel says in verse 44. And in the days of these kings, what kings? Divided Europe, Western Europe, just like we see it today. In the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And God's kingdom shall stand, how long, everybody? Forever, okay? Now, if you were a gambling person, which I'm not, but if you were a gambling person, and God said that Babylon was the head of gold, and we see that very clearly, then God said another kingdom would come, and Persia came, and they used a lot of silver, just like the metal there. Then God said another kingdom would conquer the then known world, and Greece did that, and they used a lot of bronze, just like God depicted. Then God said finally there would be a fourth kingdom, and Rome came, and they used iron. And then God said that Rome would be divided into, five, into ten, and that happened. What is the likelihood of the next part of this prophecy coming true? that the image would strike, the, the rock would strike the image on the feet and consume it. Is that a wager you'd take, yes or no, everybody? Oh, I'd take this one too. Everything has been fulfilled. There's one big thing left to happen in this prophecy right here. Daniel says, you watch while the stone was cut out without hands. That represents divinity. Of course, it's talking about Christ, who's known as the rock, was called the rock several times, the rock of ages. Christ's coming was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and break them in pieces. Now, I told you I was almost done, but you know when a minister says that he's almost done, do you know what that means? It means nothing. Just kidding. No, I am almost done. But let me share this with you. Okay, now, it's very interesting that the prophecy says that the rock strikes the image on the feet and destroys all the kingdoms. Because we're long since past Babylon. We're long since past Persia. So how could the image, the rock strike at the image on the feet and destroy all the kingdoms? Well, let me tell you how, why or how. Well, see, Babylon, we think that, oh, that's far gone and, and, and uh, in, in just a matter of history. That is not true. The philosophy and the religion and the ideas of Babylon just simply transferred down to Persia, which came to Greece, which came to Rome, which came through the ten, horn, the ten, uh, the ten toes, which comes down to our day. Now, let me give you an example of this. So let's just take the goddess of love and fertility, for example. In Babylon, she was called Ishtar. In Persia, Anita. In Greece, Aphrodite. In Rome, Venus. But you see, it's just basically the same idea and the same concept. So God says when, <clears throat> when Christ comes, he's going to destroy all these false religions, all these false philosophies, all these false ideas, and he's going to send up a pure one based on God's love and God's truth. Can you say amen to that, everybody? So here's how Daniel concludes it. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. I love the way the King James puts it. It says, the dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. You're looking for something in your life to put your trust and your confidence in? Put it in God's word, my friend. God's word can be trusted. 
it can be, uh, you can, I can bank on it. We can rely on it. Okay, let me close with this. So why does God give a prophecy like this for you and I? Why does he do that? Is he kind of like the magician who says, hey, look at me, I'm God. I can pull a rabbit out of a hat. And everybody claps and cheers. Is that what God is doing? No. You know why God is doing this amazing prophecy? Well, many reasons. But one of the reasons he's doing this is because he wants you and I to have trust in him. He wants you and I to have confidence in him and his word. Because if God can predict the rise and fall of 14 empires, and he can see all that, and then the medals that they're going to use, do you think you can trust God with your little 80 years, 90 years of your life, everybody? And, you know, the reason why I'm emphasizing this is because, as I said last night, we're going to uh, tackle some controversial things. And we're going to see some things in the Word of God. And sometimes God's Word actually steps on our toes a little bit. And sometimes God's Word comes to us in compassion and love and say, you're going this direction, I need you to go this direction. Now, let me give you a little a- illustration of this. Um, <clears throat> I was reading through the book of Proverbs several years ago, and I'm going to paraphrase it, but there's a proverb in the Bible that basically says, a lazy man has weeds growing around his house. And I looked out my window, and I thought, oh, my word. (laughs) And so that night I went out and bought a whole bunch of mulch and that black stuff that you put down right, and I covered that up. See, sometimes God's words does it, but we can trust him, my friends. So always know that if God's word points out something in our lives, it's always like the divine surgeon. You know, when you go to the doctor and you say it hurts right here, and what does the doctor start doing? He starts poking and prodding right on that red spot, right? But it's in order to bring healing in your life. And that's what God's word will do. But will you trust it, my friends? How many of you want to say to me tonight, Lord, I trust you and I trust your words? Can you raise your hand? All right, God bless you all. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you that you've not left us blind here on this planet. Lord, we have so much deception going on. We have so many voices that are calling for our attention. But, Father, help us squeeze out all those voices and mute all those voices and just hear your word because we know this is the map of life. We know this is how we can avoid the the pitfalls and the, the landmines that Satan has placed before our path. But help us have the confidence and the trust in your word. That is our prayer tonight. In Jesus' name, let everybody say amen. God bless you, everybody. See you tomorrow night. Biggie, okay?